Well, I too am very grateful uh, to being involved in this fantastic initiative. So th this is how the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, John McDonnell, now frames austerity policies. They're a political choice, not an economic necessity. And I'm going to explore whether he's right, although you've already had a preview of the answer. A good place to start is, is, is with this July 2016 remark that the rhetoric of cuts was always worse than the reality in order to gain public support. Apart from George Osborne, Harrison was probably the most important person in the Treasury. He is now a director at BlackRock, the world's biggest investment group. He is effectively blaming the public themselves for wanting cuts, but also suggesting that the Treasury knew better all along. I see here a rare glimpse of the cynical and twisted nature of policies that have done such massive harm for nearly a decade. So this is my plan. If the public really did want cuts, then it is right to start with the conditioning that came ahead of the 2010 general election, conditioning that was weaponised by the Tories. I will then set out how the co coalition government went about austerity, and I will then look at a method of assessing how the policies failed. This will include a brief discussion of multipliers, not only because they're an important analytical tool, but also because they were subsequently a bone of contention in an economic and political debate. After an overview of wider commentary on the failure of austerity, the obvious question that must be asked is why does austerity still endure? And finally, we get to John McDonnell's point. To preview the answer, ultimately we have a textbook example of doing the reverse of Stephanie's advice. An obsession with the public finances has led the government to inflict serious harm on the economy and moreover has left the public debt in a far worse position than when they started. So, for sanity's sake, it is worth remembering that it hasn't always been this way. In April 2009, Gordon Brown banged heads in London and G20 leaders agreed a brief expansionary agenda. And recession gave way to recovery. These quarter-on-quarter -quarter GDP growth figures actually show, so they're for the OECD, they show OECD GDP going non-negative in the second quarter of 2019 and then achieving some fairly decent forward momentum. But even as the ink was barely dry on the recovery, the framing of the debate abruptly shifted. In its November 2009 economic outlook, the OECD editorial was, heading, was headed preparing the exit. The commentary warned of debt reaching 100% of GDP and began to deploy the rhetoric that has been characteristic of the austerity debate, stopping the rot for some drastic measures. The UK debate itself was really triggered by a St. Valentine's Day message to the Labour government from these 20 clever and important people published in the Sunday Times. The academics were pretty much all from top universities, including, of course, the dear old UCL Economics Department, uh, just down the road. I don't know if there's any members of that department here. These academics set out very specific instructions that have coloured economic and political debate ever since. You don't have to read all these slides. I'll generally paraphrase them. So without a credible plan, long-term confidence in the economy would fail, interest rates would rise, and the currency would become unstable. Labour's pre-existing plan was not good enough, and deficit need reduction needed to proceed more quickly. Starting next financial year, at the time, 2010-11, the deficit should be all, gone, all but gone by the end of the next Parliament. Luckily, just 10 days later, the Shadow Chancellor was sh scheduled to, to deliver his Mays Lecture in the City of London, since 1979, the foremost event for the banking and financial community, according to the blurb. So George Osborne told us we were moving from a private to a public debt crisis, and he deployed for the first time Carmen Reinhart and Ken Rogoff's work that suggested that once debt reaches 90% of GDP, the risks of a large negative impact on long-term growth become highly significant. Here it is, growth in a time of debt. And there's the 90% figure. With a budget scheduled as normal for March of that year, Labour was forced to react 
they confirmed that their, their plans were to more, and more than halve the deficit over four years and they were going to maintain a credible path of fiscal consolidation. And more specifically, they announced cuts to expenditure mainly by the old chestnuts of efficiencies and reprioritizations, policies that inevitably hit non-frontline services that are less politically important. While they said spending would continue to rise in 2010-2011, afterwards they were going to slow the rate of current expenditure and allow investment as a share of the economy to, to, to fall. The sum of the parts of this Labour budget was austerity, it has to be said. Then, in April, a Goldman Sachs commentary is notable for a rare glimpse of the financial sector's own hand. But it also deployed research by Alan Cena and Arganda, who claimed that the best way to do austerity was by cutting government spending, not by raising taxes. One of the authors, I don't think it's on here, Ben Broadbent, would go on to join the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, in June 2011, and he's now the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England. Then finally, in their April 2010 manifesto, the Conservative Party made their appeal to the nation that Gordon Brown's debt, waste and taxes have wrecked the economy and threatened to kill the recovery. And of course, their mantra, which they reproduced on an A4 page, that we were all in this together. The public didn't quite buy it, but with Liberal Democrat support, the coalition government implemented austerity. Theoretically, they made a scattergun appeal to various of the points that had been raised in the run-up to the election. Confidence, interest rates, the 90% ceiling, the necessity of low deficits for high growth, and the associated ideas of expansionary fiscal contraction and crowding in, which we will come to. And of course, the rhetoric around the children, which um, we've heard before. The first change, however, was institutional. And that was the creation of the Office for Budget Responsibility, with a name straight from George Orwell. After an interim phase, its first full chairman was Robert Choate, and, and he still is the chairman. On an international view, it was one, one of a number of independent fiscal watchdogs that have sprung up exponentially since the global financial crisis. So I think the US model was in place in, in the 70s or something. So this is an organogram of the OBR with Robert Choate at the top as the chair and one of three members of a budget responsibility committee. Then below him, he's supported by an Office for Budget Responsibility staff. And then on the right, there are various oversight boards and advisory panels. You might be interested to know just how many of the officials have at least one time been in the Treasury. In practice, the OBR's role is to assess the government's chance of meeting its so-called fiscal targets for public debt and the deficit, taking into account the government's spending plans and the OBR's judgment about the state of the economy. Leaving aside the specific targets, which are sort of prone to change, more important is seeing the household arithmetic that Stephanie was talking about in practice. Probably, the specifics of policy would de derive backwards. So if we start on the left with public sector net debt as a share of GDP, the government wanted to tell their friends in the city, in the media, an improved story on the debt. So first they wanted to ensure that debt was lower in every year relative to the Labour plans. As you see, the Labour plans in red, the, cons the new Conservative plans or coalition plans in blue. And second, they wanted to have debt to begin to improve at some point. So the new profile you see peaks there in 2013-2014. This then requires a reduction in debt as a share of GDP of around five percentage points of GDP, from sort of 75% to 70%. This is then achieved on the right by reducing the deficit by between one to then 1.9 percentage points of GDP over the course of the parliament, which gives you a sort of cumulative sum of 5%, which is what they need to chop the debt, because the debt is a cumulative deficit. As Goldman Sachs proposed, this came mainly by spending, or what they call TME in the jargon. So you see the, the reduction in spending growth tapered in from 0.8 to 1.5 percentage points of GDP. On the right-hand chart, you see that it's equivalent to cash reductions ranging from about 10 billion 
to 35 billion in the year after the peak. Notes on the left hand side that it is not in the great scheme of things a very big change from what Labour had already planned. Now of course this only adds up, the household arithmetic only adds up if GDP isn't changed. So at first sight this doesn't seem to be the case. The OBR sort of flexed its independent muscles and reduced the Treasury's previously very optimistic forecast which had been for growth of about 3.5% a year to the still quite bullish 2.9%. But they fudge it by keeping nominal GDP, which is the, de the denominator for all the public finance calculations, <coughs> almost exactly the same. So technically they make a switch on the sort of price index for GDP that's the difference between real and nominal GDP, but that doesn't matter. In fact, the whole slide doesn't matter, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just how the it's sort of independence, you know, slightly blurred. So anyway, so what happened? Well, happily for me, by 2014, I had escaped the Treasury and joined the TUC. And I've helped to develop analysis to support our consistently held opposition to cuts, which I think you've had a taste of in the background material for today's lectures. So I think we should start with the cash measure of spending that has the most direct <coughs> impact on the growth of the economy. It's mislabeled actually. It should be government final consumption and investment expenditure. But on this basis, we see that the level of spending is never reduced. It's just that the growth of the spending uh, abruptly slows. So I could show you the growth figures, which are in red. So we see that annual growth in spending is reduced from an average of around 8% um, a year to an average of, of just over 1% a year once you get into the austerity period. And in fact, the position in red is the position in retrospect. The black columns, the black bits, give you George Os Osborne's original plan and he, he had growth expected to slow to 0% a year on average. And this flexibility that George Osborne showed when he was in office is, is I think, a key feature of austerity. You might notice the uh, relative surge of spending in 2014, which was just ahead of the general election in 2015, of course. Then an important device to clarify outcomes is the idea of contributions to GDP. I presume we are all familiar with the expenditure measure of GDP, which C plus I plus G plus X minus M, that adds up the various types of demand in the economy. So you see consumption, C, is by far the biggest component, but we're interested in growth, which can be much larger for some of the smaller components. So in that row, which says change percent, you see some of the small uh, components with a very large percentage change. So what contributions do is that they effectively weight percentage movements according to their overall importance in GDP, which also means that they add up on the bottom row to GDP growth. And they are most easily shown graphically. So these are the contributions to annual GDP growth over the past 17 years or so. Um, pink is the contribution of household consumption and by far the biggest component of growth, like it's the biggest component of the sort of level. Red is government. And what you see with government consumption is that it was contributing happily ahead of 2008, but then after the recession, the contribution of government basically vanishes. The trick then is to take averages of before and after the crisis. This bit basically shows how the OBR expected reduced government expenditure to so-called crowd-in private expenditure. So the first column shows the average contributions to growth before the crisis over 2002 to 2007. The second shows what the OBR thought was going to happen after the crisis. The third is the difference which has the negative red, so the reduced government expenditure, basically nearly wholly offset by increased green and yellow, by increased investment and trade. So cutting public gave way to improved private. This column shows what actually happened, and this is the actual difference with the pre-crisis position. So private investment wasn't crowded in, consumption <coughs> growth was also greatly reduced, and overall GDP growth re was reduced by nearly two percentage points a year which is effectively the price of austerity. <coughs>
I can replicate the last column using international data. Don't, don't try and figure this out, but it's just the last column for those countries. But the point is that for all 32 countries where government spending growth was reduced, overall GDP growth was also reduced. So in 32 out of 32 countries, there was no crowding in. The only three countries out on the right where GDP growth was actually stronger after the crisis were those where government spending was not cut, which is Germany, Israel and Japan for some reason. Of course, out on the left, we get some countries with their economies decimated, most obviously Latvia and Greece. Forget about that. Sticking with, the, sticking with the UK, the immediate impact of lower nominal GDP growth was lower tax revenues. And we see immediately how austerity is self-defeating. Out there in 2014-15, tax revenues were down by 45 billion. If you remember earlier, they'd cut spending by 35 billion. So they were out by 10 billion. So that they made things worse by 10 billion by cutting spending. So, back to the deficit, rather than improve from the red line to the blue line, by 2012, the outturn for the deficit had deteriorated beyond the Labour plan. In the most recent Finnish financial year, 2017-18, the deficit is still 2% of GDP, and on the current plans, they've given up trying to taking it to zero. And likewise, the debt. Forget about the level shifts, shift, which is to do with classification changes like Royal Mail Pension Funds and Housing Associations. But the key point is that the debt didn't improve by 2014-15. It continued to deteriorate until at least 2017-18. It is not that far from Ryan Hart and Rogoff's 90%, and there isn't even a great deal of improvement coming from now on. Let me stress, I'm not necessarily saying that this level of debt is a bad thing, it's just not how it was meant to be. So, why did this happen? The sensible place is to start with multipliers, and I, you may have had some reading on this. This is Keynes's intuition on the process, and it's always worth reading Keynes. So, it is often said that in Great Britain, it costs £500 capital expenditure on public works to give one man, sorry, employment for a year. The additional wages and other incomes paid out are spent on additional purchases, which lead in turn to further employment. Nor have we reached the end. The newly employed who supply the increased purchases of the employed on the new capital works will in their turn spend more, thus adding to the employment of others. One way of capturing these repeated iterations is as a geometric progression. We start with one unit of increased income, which is spent by proportion C or saved. The spending C then accrues to others as income, which is spent according to the same proportion. So a share, C of C, a share of C of C, which is equal to C squared, and so on. The sequence 1 plus C squared plus C cubed sums to 1 over 1 minus C by a standard mathematical result. Keynes called the ratio between increased consumption and increased income the marginal propensity to consume, which might be fairly stable over time. His multiplier equation then holds that an increase of government expenditure would have a multiplied increase on the overall income that depends, as in the algebra, on the MPC. More fully, should, it should also be adjusted for leakages to any spending to imports as well as saving. Now, this is very broad brush, um, but that's the world we live in. The notion was helpful to understand what was going on and to assist in policy implementation. I should also add that it was part of a wider and very sophisticated theory, but that's for another day, or you could buy my book. Um, <laughs> the multiplier was difficult to estimate in the 1930s because there weren't any decent economic statistics. And in fact, the need to measure the multiplier gave sort of impetus to the development of economic statistics. I'm not going to dwell on this, but over the 1930s, UK figures were coming in around one and a half to two, and the US figures a little higher. The next slide show my own efforts back in 2010 to estimate the multiplier using the national accounts. For the UK, I get an MPC of two thirds and a marginal propensity to import of one third, so a multiplier of a one and a half. For the US, I get an MPC that's a little higher and a, a propensity to import that's a little lower, so I get a bigger multiplier. You can think about it later. But when President Obama 
announced his stimulus in 2009, his advisers suggested that the multiplier was one and a half. Today, though, the OBR see th sees things rather differently. First, it wants different kinds of multipliers for different types of spending. Apart from in, and then, apart from for investment, they are all way below one. Um, this is very extreme. So crowding out is inherent to the OBR's multipliers. Increase, if we give it to give an example, if we have increased departmental spending, which is the Ardell line, resource departmental expenditure limits, the strange jargon. So if we have increased departmental spending of 10 billion, a multiplier of 0.6 means that the overall increase in output will be only 6 billion. So you get 10 billion, the economy is growing by only 6 billion. So that suggests that private activity will be reduced by 4 billion. And then of course you get vice versa with cuts in spending, with cuts in government spending crowding in private spending. So this is extreme, but they cite various sources in their document. One of the things they cite is by themselves. One is by the IMF, of which we'll say a bit more shortly, and the other two are by the National Institute for Economic and Social Research. There aren't any, there aren't any sources by academics. As we, have, as we have seen, the idea that cuts would crowd in private expenditure proved a delusion. In the meantime, the rest of the case for austerity unraveled. The first piece fell rather remarkably quickly. In August 2010, two authors at the Roosevelt Institute made the rather obvious point that all Alan Cena's and Argada's examples of successful consolidations are typically conditioned on culling, on culling a deficit during a boom and not during a slump. A slide made available under Freedom of Information shows the Treasury no longer deploying this source. They have redacted. <laughs> they have redacted all the information. Three years later, the Financial Times reported the work of another group of heterodox <laughs> economists. They found various spreadsheet errors and omissions that completely debunked Reinhardt and Rogoff's results. If you look at the red bit, they find over 1946 to 2009, countries with public debt to GDP ratios above 90%, average 2.2% real annual GDP growth, not minus 0.1% as published. So it was completely wrong. Um, but in the meantime, the rest of the world was beginning, you know, this is the start of austerity, the rest of the world was beginning to fear rese renewed recession or what they called the double dip. So then the IMF themselves jump ship in its October World Economic Outlook for 2012, though the results, in fact, were doing the rounds in sort of Treasury and the Bank of England somewhat earlier. In a nifty bit of analysis, though it has to be said that the Treasury were very far from impressed or thrilled at the time, they showed how the errors in the IMF's own growth forecasts, which is on the unlabeled vertical axis, were very closely related to the amount of austerity on the horizontal axis. Most obviously you get poor Greece in the bottom right corner, but there's a quite a clear negative relation throughout. They junked their own multiplier estimate of 0.5 and suggested that the multiplier was between 0.9 and 1.7, which I suppose is better late than never. In August of the same year, the New Statesman had the rather brilliant idea of going back to the 20 economists who wrote to the Sunday Times. Under the heading, Osborne supporters now turn on him, they reported how 19 of the 20 had changed their minds, though in general, the respondents were mainly concerned with explaining how they weren't actually wrong. My favourite comment is by John Vickers. Thanks, but I'll pass on this. I could go on, but I won't. Um, for what it's worth, with my multiplier of 1.5, seems to fit the bill for the UK. If I return to contributions to growth, government expenditure contributed 0.3 percentage points to GDP after the crisis, compared with 1.6 percentage points before the crisis, which is a reduction of 1.3 percentage points of GDP. If I apply my multiplier to this, I retrospectively predict a reduction to overall GDP growth of 1.9 percentage points, which is as near as damn it to the actual reduction of GDP of 1.8 percentage points. And as Victoria Chick and Pettifer and myself predicted at the time, 
When sustained, fiscal consolidation increases rather than reduces the public debt ratio and is in general associated with adverse macroeconomic conditions. Though, because of my institutional affiliation, I left my name off the document until we issued a revised one in 2016. So, why does austerity endure? When austerity began, a senior Treasury official reported a meeting with Larry Summers, a big shot US economist. Larry said to him, if austerity is the right policy, then everything I know about economics is wrong. So, austerity was highly contentious. There was only thin evidence, which shortly afterwards was categorically refuted. The policy then failed in practice, yet it still continues. Why? So, first, I think, it's that there is still support from prominent economic institutions. The OBR in 2012 allowed the Treasury to blame the Eurozone when the original threat, when, so when the original threat of recession loomed, the OBR allowed the Treasury to blame the Eurozone. When, of course, the Eurozone crisis was, of course, also down to austerity. Moreover, blaming Europe is a stretch for permanently reduced growth. The whole of the economics profession then decided that the failure was down to problems of the economy rather than problems with, rather than problems with policy, i.e. with productivity. Nearly 10 years later, they have still failed to come up with an explanation of how productivity might have fooled, and anyway, you can explain productivity easily as a result of policy. Today, policymakers say that the economy is operating at capacity. So there is no, more, no, there's no longer any more room to do spending, even if we wanted to do spending. To reinforce the point, the Bank of England is raising interest rates. But spare capacity is manifest in higher inflation. And at the moment, inflation is falling. And in spite of a growing body of evidence, there is denial about multipliers. On his retirement, the original macroeconomist on the Budget Responsibility Committee, Professor Stephen Nicholl, was asked about multipliers in an interview with the independent newspaper. He did not yield. He was still perfectly happy with the OBR's original judgments on this front, although they were the Treasury's judgments. The point should not be that there are lots of multipliers out there. The point should be, the point should be to figure out which one looks the least wrong. In the meantime, Paul Johnson of the Institute for Fiscal Studies continues to preach the doctrine of the household budget at every opportunity granted by the BBC and others. This, is how, this is, was how he reacted to talk about austerity ending in about March last year. The trouble is, Paul Johnson's laws of economics are wrong. The second reason is that UK jobs growth the UK jobs have grown with more vigour than before the crisis. So you see on the blue line, post-crisis employment growth is higher than pre-crisis employment growth. The flip side is, of course, that wage growth has slumped like never before on the purple line. And there are fundamental issues around the quality of work. This chart barely captures the wage story, but the notion that we're in the worst pay crisis for two centuries is not hyperbola. Third is the role of the Bank of England. The red line here shows the stock of government bonds produced under the quantitative easing programme. When things started to get rough under austerity, the bank announced a new 75 billion programme of QE in October 2011. So you see the line lurch up. And then an additional 50 billion in July 2012. QA may be billed as a monetary action, but there is an important overlap with fiscal policy. Government bond purchases mean that QE is effectively supporting fiscal policy. But in contrast to Stephanie's proposals, this is central bank deposit creation to support a fiscal policy failure, not to support economic advantage. It also leads to wider questions about policymakers and money creation processes, but perhaps I'll come to that afterwards because we're running out of time. Um, there is then... There is then the pragmatic approach of the government and the coalition, recalling Rupert Harrison's remarks at the start of the discussion. Further cuts were not imposed when the original cuts began to fail, as might have been demanded by the letter of orthodox law. The, then, most obviously, the unspoken reversal of, fis of policy in 2014 was doubtless helpful to general election 2014, 
ahead of the EU referendum, the Treasury very unhelpfully threatened a punishment budget in the event of a leave vote. Wisely, Philip Hammond relaxed rather than intensified austerity. And now the end of austerity is proclaimed when debt is even further from repair than ever before. And of course, austerity hasn't ended beyond the pledge to the NHS. But the current climate is certainly different. The economics profession, more generally, must merit a mention. We have seen the 20 back down. But beyond a handful of more active academics, the profession in this country remains aloof from the failure of macroeconomic policy. But this is no means peculiar to the UK. Just last week, Peter Doyle, a former senior economist at the IMF, wrote of severely punitive measures inflicted by his former colleagues on Jamaica. And he said, Keynes must be spinning in his grave, seeing the institution he founded, he means the IMF, inflicting policies that he excoriated in the economic consequences of the peace on another defenseless country, while the profession he also founded and in whose name it is done, i.e. macroeconomics, says nothing. The, economics, the American Economics Association, which is the foremost body for economists on the planet, cannot make such malpractice calls. It is a chummy, self-lauding club of academic, academics. The shadow, that's it for the slides. Exhausted myself. The Shadow Chancellor is without a doubt justified in his claim that austerity is a political choice. The Conservatives have played austerity politics while operating behind the scenes in a more nuanced manner. This is not to neglect the vast damage to the public services and to the reward for and the quality of work, let alone the immense hardships of individual debts and the fracturing of social relations that have been intensified by the Brexit process. But they have secured political cover by keeping the economy broadly afloat and moving forwards. Moreover, we shouldn't forget that it was a political choice that has been facilitated every step of the way by orthodox academia, which is amplified by the media. And of course, there have been dissenting voices throughout, but in public debate, these are drowned out by the illusion of status. Nobody except the Guardian and the Independent was interested that Lord Skidelsky's letter opposing austerity in 2010 got more signatures than the Sunday Times letter supporting it. And in the meantime, the most high-profile public institutions, as we've seen, continue to promote a highly orthodox approach. But there is also a bigger picture, I think. And that concerns the wider economic model that's sometimes known as neoliberalism, though for me is better labelled as financial globalisation. As soon as some sort of recovery from the Great Recession had begun, the terms of the debate were changed. This was exemplified in George Osborne's Mays Lecture. <coughs> Concern with the private debt gave way to the public debt. So rather than continue discussing how to repair conditions that had led to the global financial crisis, blame was repositioned onto governments. To, re to reframe a financial crisis as a crisis of government is a very standard play that probably resonates across the centuries. After the Great Depression, Keynes led the restoration of something very different. The gold standard regime for monetary policy was permanently ended. Instead, a regime of permanently low interest rates, which, which Stephanie mentioned, supported by capital the control of capital on international flows of capital was put into place. The new arrangements permitted higher government expenditure to support the recovery from as early as 1934 in the UK and a year earlier in the US under Roosevelt. A broadly similar but, but not ideal regime prevailed for a quarter of a century after the Second World War, an epoch we now know as the Golden Age. Today, in the wake of a not dissimilar crisis, we are instead slowly discovering the results political as well as economic, of taking no positive course of action, nor, I suspect, is it over. Out there beyond the Brexit debate is a world of immense financial and economic fragility. Sidetracked by a wrong-headed and dangerous preoccupation with public debt, private debt has grown ever higher to an all-time global peak, which I would show you on a chart if I hadn't given up. Um, Towards the end of last year, both the IMF and the OECD were warning of the real dangers of renewed global recession. So, austerity is very, very far from an economic necessity. It is a sideshow, a brutal, wrong and dangerous sideshow, but a sideshow nonetheless. 
and I still think there is everything to play for.